Adventures of Irving Man. Yes, it's Irving Man, strange visitor from California who came to Tacoma with powers and abilities far beyond ordinary YouTubers. Irving Man, who can change the most innocuous statement into a dumb joke, still lives in his childhood with his old TV shows, and who, disguised as Irving J. Funkenmeyer, fights a never-ending battle for laughter, music, and ad revenue. We open today on an average house in an average neighborhood where average boy Bobby Jackson and his average great-grandfather are watching television. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin. Floods at nearby Levee City have reached the disaster stage. Thousands of homeless people lack food, shelter, and clothing. The last is desperately needed. We repeat, clothing is desperately needed. Silly me, I forgot about Butch the dog. Bobby feels the need, and he knows he and Grandfather have lots of extra clothes they could donate. He asks, and Grandfather says, go ahead. Did you hear that, Great Gramps? All those poor people needing clothes. Can I do what the man said? Can I? You've got a whole week we can send. Can I? Yep. Boy, oh boy! Of course, for all Great Gramps heard him, he could have been asking if it was okay for Butch to poop on the rug. That would be the Prince Albert coat mentioned in the name of the episode. Since it gets title billing, we can assume Bobby shouldn't have done that. Yep, this is it. Now listen, cue ball. I get first pick of the stuff this time. Shh, not so loud, pal. You want the customers to hear? Don't grab for nothing until we pull around the corner. We got a nice little racket, Mike. Be careful. Okay, okay. Not only do they get paid to do the pickups, they go through the stuff they pick up, pull out anything valuable, and either keep it for themselves or sell it. You have to hope when they go home this evening, they discover they lived in the flood zone, too. Great Gramps has been at the park slaughtering people at Checkers. I took them. <laughs> I took them. I jumped. I jumped two men and a king. Oh, I swear to goodness. I blasted them. Just like General Lee did them blue boys down there at Bull Run. Why do I have a feeling he was there? And by the way, great Gramps, you do remember that in the end Lee lost? I will never understand this bit about nostalgia for the Confederacy. The CSA was so poorly run, large portions of the population either starved or had to move away. The goal was to keep owning other human beings because it was profitable to do so. They convinced a lot of people it was about states' rights, which was and is a lie. Kids as young as 14 went to war and died so the plantation owners could keep their lavish lifestyles. Let's at least be honest about that. I got rid of all my old stuff from some junk you had in the closet. Junk? What junk? An old sweater, a straw hat, that funny old coat that was in the trunk, a pair of shoes. My... My what? My, my old coat? My old coat? You saw it. His knees buckled. Telling him that was like the worst punch in the gut he ever got. Come on, Bobby. We gotta find it. We just got to. But why, Mr. Jackson? Why are you so upset? Wouldn't you be upset, too, if that was your coat, ma'am? And in the lining was your whole life savings? $10,000 in cash? He doesn't trust banks, so now he's on a scavenger hunt. He needs to go home because he's about to fall on his face, and I know from experience that beyond a certain age, that's not a thing you want to be doing. The lady will keep searching and let him know the moment she finds out where it went. But he'll be going home alone for the moment because Bobby has an idea. When Mrs. Craig said it was like looking for a needle in a haystack and almost impossible, and when I saw how upset Great Gramps was, I knew there was only one answer. Superman. Superman's got to help me. He will, won't he, Miss Lane? In the first place, Bobby, it wasn't your fault. You didn't know the money was in the coat. You were just doing a kind deed. The problem is, Clark is the only one who knows how to contact Superman, and he's out of town until tomorrow. In the meantime, Lois will put a story in the paper about the missing coat and see if anyone comes forward with it. Just don't mention the money, duh. What the people at the relief agency don't know won't hurt them. We made 18 bucks on a side. Not a bad day. 
See what happens when you listen to me? Yeah, I listen to you. $10,000 worth. Huh? Says right there, wanted my grandfather's coat. $10,000 hidden and given away coat. Well, now, what about the coat, I ask him? Well, it's too old, says he. Well, it wasn't too old to hold 10,000 bucks. Uh, shut up. Now, we was the ones that loaded that stuff. What truck did we throw it in? Joe Pesci, 100 pounds later, says, we figure out which truck, we go where it went, we get the coat, we're rich. So far, the story hasn't done any good. That's why I'm glad you're back, Clark. Maybe Superman Well, can... I'm sure he'd be glad to help if he can, Lois. That is, if he's needed. What about the drivers? Did the boy describe them to Mrs. Craig? Perhaps we can trace the shipment through them. He says, I know you're all set to take Jimmy, go to the flood area, and start looking. You do that while I go talk to the relief people and see if we can track those guys down. Superman takes off out the storage room window as usual, while Lois tells Jimmy to have a car ready so they can head out as quick as Clark finds anything. Levy City. Levy City, here we come. Oh, wait a minute. We better stop by and see Mr. Jackson. Then he'll have a little hope. He's not in the mood for hope, but they say they're going to go there and try anyway. Can I go, Miss Lane? I know what it looks like and maybe... What do you think, Mr. Jackson? Well, I reckon he'd kill if he's to mind to. Thanks, Craig Gramps. Two experienced reporters have never seen a dog whistle before, so Bobby has to explain it. So does every other show from the 50s and 60s that ever used one. And since we focused on it for a whole scene, you know it's going to be important later on. Butch won't be going with them. His job is to look after Great Gramps while Bobby is away. We've seen Great Gramps before on this show. When Lois and Jimmy were dealing with the bully of Dry Gulch, he was Gunner's sidekick Sagebrush. Then when the whole crew went to Dagger Island, he turned out to be Mr. Craymore. His real name was Raymond Hatton, and like so many actors of his era, he was a fixture in westerns. Now, he was a good one to do that because he was born in 1887, which means he grew up around the last few decades of the so-called Wild West and could go see it for himself if he wanted, so he had a fair idea what it was like. That didn't stop him from doing it the Hollywood way, of course. He was married to his wife for 62 years until she died in 1971. Five days later, he followed her. Apparently, he wasn't interested in living without her. I can empathize. We're in Levy City at the Relief Warehouse. Who's going to get there first, Lois and Jimmy or our two delivery boys? I say, my good chap, Vanderlip here. Mortimer Vanderlip. Yes? Star of stage, screen, and riverboat. Neither. Our fancy Poppin' Jay will get there first. He's supposed to do a show tonight, but the flood washed all his costumes away. He'll discover that the Prince Albert coat is exactly what he needs. And by the way, my man, if you have to go around telling people what a big star you are, you don't really believe it yourself. Get some therapy for your insecurities. Clark had Henderson checking on the drivers, and they both have records. That doesn't necessarily mean they're still criminals, but something doesn't smell right. Clark is off to Levy City himself. Yes? We're from the Daily Planet. This is Miss Lane, and I'm Jim Olson. Uh, maybe you saw the story in one of the early editions? Matter of fact, I did glance at it. And this must be the young fellow you wrote about. Do you have the coat? I'm sorry, but I gave it away very early this morning before I saw the paper. Fortunately, Mortimer Vanderlip is a distinctive enough name that he remembers it. I've got it. Ivesville. Mortimer Vanderlip and that coat will be in Ivesville tonight. Oh, that's wonderful. Thanks a lot, sir. It's quite all right. Come on. That's them. The men who picked up the stuff at the house. Hi, kid. Gee, I'm glad we got together here. Yeah, I bet you are. He spins a yarn about how they feel terrible and want to help find the coat and the money for Bobby. Lois doesn't trust him. Oh, come on, Lois. Look at those faces. What's not to trust? Like I said, we're good guys. We want to help. Right, Mike? Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Hey, I got a swell idea. Driving is our business. Why don't you folks rest, and we'll drive you to Ivesville? Well, Chippers, Miss Lane, you and I are both dog tired. Why don't we let him go along? Well, okay, let's go. I foresee trouble. Hey, what's going on here? Why do we stop? End of the line. Okay, out of the car, all of you, and over this way. It's such a burden always being right, you know? 
How'd you know about this place? My brother-in-law used to farm it, but he couldn't make a go of it. Oh, well, what's it? This here's the smokehouse. Still good and solid. You mean your brother-in-law used to have to come out here when he wanted to take a smoke? No, stupid. It's for smoking meat and hams and bacon and stuff like that. You wouldn't believe what he had to do to roll an entire ham into a smokable cigar. Mr. McCoy? Yes? My name is Clark Kent, sir. I'm from the Metropolis Daily Planet. More reporters? I've already spoken to two of your staff. I know. Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen. As a matter of fact, I'm looking for them right now, sir. The Ivesville Road, Mr. Kent. And I don't want to be rude, but we're clearing out as fast as we can. This is an emergency. The entire city's in danger. What do you mean, sir? The Levee City Dam is about to give way any minute. Superman will have to make a side trip before he goes to help his friends. That doesn't look like a dam. It looks more like the Panama Canal lock that they used in Team America. We probably don't want to know what those girders used to be holding up. Gosh, I wish Butcher was around. I'd blow this and he'd start barking, and his bark would bring help. I'm sure he would, Bobby. Don't get patronizing, Lois. You've seen it in action. And besides, we all know what's going to happen. <laughs> How does he change the angle of his x-ray vision like that? Superman! Am I glad to see you? Well, you can thank Bobby's whistle for that. You answer this? Why, sure. Well, hey, Superman, you could have come in through the door. Well, I know I could have, Jimmy, but, uh, well, this seemed a little more spectacular. Thank you for finally admitting you're a show-off and glory hog. But I'll bring it back. All Grandpa wants to do is take one more look. I promise, mister. My word, my lord, is noble, but only twixt thy conscience and thyself. It is not for me to judge. Well, good day, gentlemen. You can bet they don't recognize the quote. To be honest, neither do I. It sounds Shakespeareish, but I wouldn't swear to it under oath. Yeah, why don't we quit fooling around with him, just slug him and take the coat? I guess we'll have to. If you choose to use force, you'll doubtless prevail, but I assure you I'll resist with the last ounce of my strength. That will not be necessary, Mr. Vandelet. Mister, uh, are you, you really Superman? Yes, I am. I knew you were talking to get us in trouble. <laughs> Superman? I wonder if Superman is ever disappointed when they make it that easy. He asks to borrow the coat for a few moments. He'll have it back in time for the performance. Mr. Vanderlip says you I trust to bring it back. While he's waiting, he'll call the police to pick up our would-be tycoons. But Mr. Jackson, why, this is Confederate money. Yes, I know. But I knew it would come into its own sooner or later. Just a matter of time, that's all. Mr. Jackson, sir, I hate to be the one to tell you this, but I'm afraid it's worthless. You're kidding, right? Those bills appear to be in excellent shape. Collectors, museums, Civil War buffs, and lots of others will pay top real dollar for those. In fact, that stuff is probably worth several times its face value. Too bad nobody will think of that, which bugs me a little. Gramps says, well, there goes Bobby's college fund. Just in time, there's someone at the door. I'm Thomas Summerfield, president of the Carryville, Alabama National Bank. Our paper happened to carry your story, and I'm happy to say it enabled us to finally locate you, something I've been trying to do for years. Here you are, sir. It's a check for $5,000 and change, but why? Before he enlisted, your daddy deposited in our bank, you being a babe in arms, several hundred dollars in gold for you. That's it, sir, with interest all these years. Well, I'll be dang jiggered. And after the way I've been talking about banks all the time, I feel I owe you an object apology, sir. Show him the Confederate money. I'll bet he can help you find a buyer. So all is well, he has a nice little nest egg of actual American dollars for Bobby's future. Mr. Vanderlip has his coat back in time for his performance, and Bobby is a hero several times over because this all started with him doing a good deed. Couldn't you just get sick? I have to agree, Fred. It's getting so sappy in here, I'm going to have to take a shower. Hey, friends, if you enjoyed the video, please click the thumbs up button and let me and YouTube know it. If you're not subscribed yet, you know what to do. 
And remember, you can become a patron of this channel for as little as $2 a month. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.